When creating a video game, developers are entrusted with the difficult task of enticing players through accessible, yet complex and rewarding gameplay. In making a product that stays with participants long after putting the controller down, a relationship needs to be formed through more than just achieving high scores. Rich, creative worlds with engaging characters and dynamic stories are hard enough to create on their own and can end up as afterthoughts or completely cut due to budget or having to focus their efforts elsewhere. On rare occasions, the two factors come together in perfect unison, providing audiences with an unforgettable experience, such as the case with the video game Parappa the Rapper. Released on the Sony PlayStation in Japan in 1996 and North America in 1997, Parappa helped introduce rhythm games into the mainstream, using a call-and-response style system where players would perform rapping by accurately mimicking button inputs that would appear on screen. It was a surprise hit, selling 3 million copies, even catching the eye of legendary Mario and Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto, who in 1999 stated, I appreciate Parappa's creator's efforts, because at Nintendo, even though we have so many game franchises, we're always trying to create something new with each game. Because we are doing these kind of things, we can appreciate the efforts made by the Parappa the Rapper team to try to create a new genre. Sony knew they had something special too, making a concerted effort in trying to make Parappa a marketable video game icon by releasing a rap album, all sorts of toys and merchandise, and even a Japanese anime. Airing from 2001 to 2002, the anime ran for 30 episodes, following Parappa and his friend group encountering common, and not so common, struggles of everyday life, while having as much fun as possible along the way. The game's obtuse characters paper art style and musical stylings seemed tailor-made for a cartoon. So how did the hip-hop hero starring role in an animated show fare? Let's take a look at the cartoon based off the game where onions teach dogs karate. This is the Parappa the Rapper anime. The Parappa the Rapper video game was born from the mind of Japanese game designer Masaya Matsura. Matsura's professional journey originally began in music, working as the composer, arranger, and synthesizer player for the Japanese band Psy S. After eventually leaving the band, he shifted his focus on creating video games. As he explains, quote, in the 90s, I discovered new themes, such as multimedia or interactivity. I knew that was it. I really had that feeling." End quote. By 1994, with the concept for Parappa in production, Matsura was introduced to American illustrator Rodney Greenblatt. Greenblatt was a US artist hired to a licensing division of Sony called Sony Creative Products. Quote, I was working for them designing cute characters for printed items and toys. The wonderful team at Sony Creative introduced you to Matsura and his game project. Matsura and his team were already fans of my children's books and CD-ROM productions. They asked me to design the characters and world for the new mysterious and fantastic PlayStation 1. The concept of a rhythm-based music game was new in mainstream gaming asking the player to mimic the button inputs provided by characters in-game. It was revolutionary, helping usher in an entirely new game genre that remains widely popular. For as profound as the introduction to this new style of musical gaming was, equally recognized was the game's unforgettable art style. All the characters are two-dimensional paper cutouts existing within a 3D world. It feels like comic strip characters that have stepped into our dimension, down to the way they walk, picking up their feet, 
but still having them face horizontally. Greenblatt recounts, quote, Matsura already had the rap idea and the cutout thing in his head. All they needed from me was to draw the thing, so that's what I did. They told me what kind of teachers would be in each level and what the levels were like. And then I just did tons of sketches of what they might be. So in that way, I collaborated on the story, because some of my characters were better than what they were thinking. So they changed the story to adapt what my characters were, which was great. Greenblatt's inspiration came from early animated shows, Gumby, Rocky and Bullwinkle, and Speed Racer having the most creative impact in his life. Mixed with his love for Picasso and Matisse, and quote, Sony's confidence along with the game team's incredible creativity, made it easy for me to make the best characters. And the world is one of the most unique and eye-catching I've ever seen in an animated realm due to their dimensional plane, and the unbridled creativity from every character, from forefront to background. It's immensely entertaining looking at all the characters. The unbridled creativity feels never-ending. You'll have characters that could be anything as simple as an anthropomorphic dog, to a person's body with a milk carton for a head, eyes, nose, and mouth included. Your retinas will definitely stay busy looking at all the fun, unique, and kooky characters and locales. The game became an unexpected success, and with that, the rights for television to Parappa were obtained by a Japanese anime production company, with both them and Sony hoping to increase visibility for the newfound icon, just in time for the release of the PlayStation 2 game, Parappa the Rapper 2. With the show primed to take over the airwaves, and launch this new character into the hearts of the world, it's time to break down what this show was all about. In making the move from game to TV, a number of characters made the trip, starting with the game's lead protagonist, Parappa. The star of the show, he's an optimistic yet intensely over-anxious kid. In between hanging with his friends and intermittent daydreams, he's usually found pining for his friend and crush, Sunny. Next, we have PJ, the effortlessly cool guy of the group. PJ's life consists mainly of oversleeping, overeating, and DJing at the local dance hall. There's Katie, the trendy posh girl, her fashion sense and cool disposition are rivaled only by her unapologetic attitude. And finally, rounding out the original crew is Sunny, the sugary sweet flower girl. She's a kind soul who's always wanting the best for her friends and completely oblivious to Parappa's love for her. The cast didn't end there though, adding four additional characters created specifically for the show, beginning with Matt, the blank slate vessel for the audience with a refreshingly strong identity. He's an eager go-getter that's always searching for ways to better himself and the group of friends. Paula, the fiery girl fresh to Parappa Town, she's even keeled with an indifferent demeanor until there's an injustice she disagrees with where she'll readily fly off the handle for what she believes in. And finally, Gaster and Gruber, the main antagonists, if you can really call them that. They scheme and plot for ways to get rich or send Parappa Town into turmoil. Their plans are usually foiled by Parappa's crew or their own bad luck. Now adding four new characters to accompany the existing ones was a risky move. It was understandably done to expand the universe and it could have been a major weakness had it not been handled well. Fortunately, not only do the new kids fit in alongside Parappa's team, they feel like they've always existed. They're just as quirky as the main cast, with their own personalities fitting right in line with characters that could have come straight from the games. Matt's Boy Scout sense of curiosity and drive are very classic protagonist fare, but rather than being generic, 
he has a happy-go-lucky nature about him, and he pushes the group forward with encouragement and new ideas. He's a pragmatic source of energy that enhances the eagerness of the entire group. Paula, on the other hand, is fantastic, but for all the opposite reasons. She comes off as too cool for school and largely unimpressed with things a majority of the time. In the first episode, she comes into town and quickly stokes the flames of a rivalry with Katie. The two, having similar dominant temperaments and snarky attitudes, immediately get on each other's nerves. The resolution that they would wind up as friends was predictable, but I didn't mind it. I was looking forward to see how these two headstrong girls would be brought together and it was resolved in a way that felt true to the characters and was a great first interaction for Paula. And that's where the strength of the show lies. Although Matt and Paula are largely opposites, their consideration for their friends is what brings them together. And the bond between the friend group is one of the show's highlights. The six openly care for each other. And rather than coming off as forced or hokey, there's a very real charm and sweetness that breeds a contagious positivity. It flat out made me feel good to watch these kids be so supportive in a way that never wavers. It's a group of friends that want to see one another succeed, and the goodness that fuels their intentions is energizing. At the other end of that spectrum are Gaster and Gruber, the two bad guys who want to spread fear and ruin through Parappa Town. Gaster is the half-brain of the duo's operation, always devising get-rich-quick schemes and plans of want and destruction. His sidekick Gruber is a big round cat, who's more of the dopey fall guy, but also the one who pokes holes in Gaster's plans. Gaster and Gruber are essentially part of the main cast, just lurking in the shadows. And what was funny to see as the series continued was how their plans escalated. In the very first episode, the entire plot revolves around Gaster stealing Parappa's bicycle, which is standard enough fare. Later in the series, they pose as owners of a sushi restaurant in order to drill into the bank vault located next door. I've seen similar plans in movies, so it's not that far-fetched. But maybe their wackiest scheme involves stealing a star baseball player's oversized banana in an effort to kidnap him, then force him to sign autographs for eternity to make them millionaires. I have never heard of that. It's certainly a long way from bike theft, and offers another fun surprise for the audience to look forward to. And these two plans act as another offering of a surprise for the audience to look forward to. Now some side characters from the games do make an appearance, such as Parappa's dad and even a few rap senseis, mixed in with the new characters that pop up in every episode, which mesh well together and are enjoyable and seamless as they interact. Any of these characters could have been incorporated into the games with little strain, and that's a point in favor of the show's writers. The two most curious adaptations to come from the games are undoubtedly the art and the music. Starting with the art side, the game had the blend of 2D characters interacting in a 3D world. It was distinctive, giving the universe its own flavor. I had never seen a game look the way it had before, and the closest now that I can equate it to would be the Paper Mario series. But that's solely based on the paper aesthetic. The difference here is that Paper Mario leans into the characters actually being constructed of paper. Parappa, on the other hand, stays away from that concept and maintains that they still exist in the third dimension, but just happen to be two-dimensional beings. The anime didn't end up using this style, possibly because of the cost and difficulty rendering 3D environments at the time. But if it was done at a lower budget, I think it would have been in line with what the games presented. 
colorful locations that were memorable for how silly they were. Instead, the entire show is animated in 2D, which isn't a bad thing in any respect. The show still pops, with vibrant colors and fun environments, and in a nice nod to the original character designs, the natives in the world keep a mostly flat side profile. While not line thin, they do have skinnier profiles, which was as close to the game as it could get without just drawing a straight black line. It looked funny, but in a way where I could tell what they were going for, so at least they were aware and made an attempt at emulating the game. I'd describe the visuals overall as fairly simple, except when they give us my favorite recurring gag throughout the series. At random moments, the animation will shift from ordinary to gorgeously detailed, but it's at unexpected times, which makes it hilarious when the unannounced change happens. My favorite instance of this is a scene where Parappa and friends are on a bus full of people that winds up stuck on the railroad tracks. The boys and other riders panic, and as they cut to the image of the train barreling down the track, the animation is suddenly luscious, drawn in a realistic way, looking like a completely different cartoon as it smashes into the bus. I was so taken aback, I genuinely laughed out loud. There's never any indication or warning when these moments will occur, and it's extremely funny and catches you off guard whenever it happens. Overall, the animation is fun and serviceable, letting the character's antics and jokes shoulder the brunt of responsibility of being entertaining. The show itself is your typical comedic ensemble sitcom. Every episode, Parappa and his friends face either a real-life issue, like trying to save a theater from being torn down, or more fantastical problems, such as trying to escape the world within PJ's nose after a sleep bubble engulfs the group. And that's where the show really shines, with its humor. The Parappa games have always had surreal ideas and themes to them, and this cartoon is no exception. One memorable example happens during class time at school, when Parappa drops a pencil on the floor, frightening his wimpy teacher, who hides under his desk out of fear at the sound. As the students berate him, his already small level of confidence grows smaller, affecting his physical body too making him shrink as he hears their unflattering opinions of him. But after Parappa and his friends receive advice from his fortune-telling boombox how to make the teacher braver, they follow its advice and stick an empty bucket on his foot, transforming the once cowardly teacher into a no-nonsense, violent punisher. There's no context to be had, and it's completely nonsensical. But these are the sort of situations you'll find yourself engrossed in. That some way result in heartwarming endings that make you look forward to the next episode. There's also several in-jokes that appear throughout, and the best part is how completely random they are. In one scene, Parappa, Matt, and PJ are riding a bus with other passengers and a hiding Gaster and Gruber. Parappa and friends are so excited about their journey, they start singing the show's theme song. And yes, I mean their own show's theme song. And it was cute. But then the rest of the writers, and the villains included, sing along. It was out of the blue, but so gleefully silly that I couldn't help but love it. My favorite running gag was Matt taking phone calls throughout the series, giving updates on his and the group's happenings to whoever was on the side of the line. I wondered if it would ever be addressed, maybe the subject would come up in its own episode perhaps? But to my surprise, one of the characters does mention it in one of the last episodes. But it quickly gets dismissed, which admittedly was frustrating, but in a humorously exasperated way. And it's small comedic touches like these 
that give the anime its own goofy, lovable spin. As quirky fun as the show is, there are some choices that could have aided in making it even better. First, I think it was a major miscalculation to not incorporate more characters from the games. At this point, Parappa the Rapper and its spin-off Um Jammer Lammy had already been released, and in anticipation of the upcoming Parappa 2, we only get a few appearances from existing characters. The lack of Jo Chin, the two bullies, Jet Baby, or any of the unused rap senseis among others seems perplexing. The games were solely about the catchy music and memorable characters, and to have them left out in favor of more plain people in their place is a bit of a letdown. The main cast who do make a return are mostly faithful to their game counterparts, albeit to varying degrees. Katie remains largely unaltered, PJ went from bumbling food lover to monotone hipster, which works well for getting laughs in my opinion, but the two characters who do get dragged down are Sunny and Parappa. Sunny is the one character in the entire series that I would dread being on screen, which is ironic, because in the games, if there was a scene, I knew there would be a funny Parappa in love reaction coming up and she was a calming presence in a planet full of lovable weirdos. In the anime, however, she is near unbearable, replacing her straight woman persona with that of a constant crier. It doesn't matter the situation. Sunny is overly empathetic, spending what feels like all her time whining her way through episodes. This wasn't constantly, but enough to the point where I would grip my teeth, bracing myself for the worst from her. Which is too bad, because I enjoyed in the games her wide-eyed passion for life and obliviousness towards Parappa's affections. Regarding Parappa, he's still the do-gooder we've come to love, but his persona is less in line with his original one, and not for the better. While he wasn't always the most decisive or maybe had pie-in-the-sky thoughts that could be brought back to Earth by the harsh realities of life, he still came off as a good guy who was just figuring life out. This version of Parappa sees him practically afraid of everything life has to offer. He's always expecting failure and spends a good amount of time worried, panicking, or straight moping over things not going his way. In an episode where he accidentally breaks a store window and has to find a way to earn the money to fix it, he's understandably feeling down about his predicament, but his friends volunteer to get jobs to help him pay off his debt. Instead of celebrating their sacrifices, he continues to feel sorry for himself, saying that he won't be good at any jobs, as the others struggle working as new employees. Now, to be fair, this is the most extreme low point Parappa himself falls to, but he still leans much more into this direction than how he's represented in the games. And for a hero whose catchphrase is, I gotta believe, that's the one thing he doesn't do very frequently. I think there's a deeper reason to this, which leads me to my biggest problem with the series. The lack of music. What a poor decision to not have any music featured in a show based off a musically themed game. Aside from ambient songs, which are toe tappers, there are a few actual songs that do play. The show's two theme songs play every episode, which I was always excited to hear and looked forward to when they would get played, be it in montages, as a vinyl disc at Club Fun. It was always a neat surprise to see how they would be integrated. And I never got sick of them, because they're so good. Even the end credits theme was a jam. You know it has to be, when you sit through the credits, just to listen. Sadly, however, this is the extent of the soundtrack. There is not one song or scene where Parappa even does as little as rhyme. And this is where I think the tie to his character is directly affected. 
In the games, Parappa encounters inconveniences and problem situations at his every turn, but gains the confidence to face these troubles through rap. Without him rapping in the show, they never created a replacement solution that was consistently used. So instead of him using music to solve his problems, he primarily relies on his friends to get him out of precarious situations. And while that's fine, it feels more that he's being rescued than getting through situations fully on his own. Forget for even a moment that it could have been potentially used to move the plot forward or develop Parappa's character, but how great of a tie-in to the past and future games would that have been? Presenting the video game rappers old and new to viewers, getting them interested in what the games might have to offer, and who knows, maybe the songs from the show would have been good enough to be featured in an upcoming Parappa game, as feature tunes or maybe hidden ones. I wouldn't call this an oversight, merely due to the fact that this had to have been discussed when working on the show in pre-production, but it was a choice that, for whatever reason, was made, and left so much untapped potential. I'm satisfied in saying, the Parappa the Rapper anime features an incredibly large amount of delightful episodes with characters and plots ranging from mundane to inexplicably odd. The following are my five favorite episodes. Episode 7, You Sure Are Bougie. Parappa and friends attempt to help a firefighter named Puddle end up with the woman he loves in spite of her father's wishes. The seventh episode of the series, but the first to feature one of the game's rap senseis, the kids come across Puddle, as seen in Unjammer Lammy, who is distraught that he can't be with the woman he loves due to her father's disapproval. It's nice to see a familiar face in Puddle, and most closely resembles the quirky storytelling and humor from the games, but takes odd turn after Goofy Twist with the reason the father does not want Puddle and his daughter to be together, too good to spoil here. Episode 8, Don't Let Anyone Find It After mentioning how she would like to go into space, Parappa enlists Matt and PJ to help him build a rocket ship, while keeping it a secret from the rest of the school. This episode has warmth to it. Holding a secret that the audience doesn't know about until almost halfway through the episode makes you wonder what the friends could possibly be hiding from each other. And seeing how the secret gets around the school and the teacher's overreaction to it, it's a fun one right through the end. Episode 10, I Smell Bananas. Parappa's favorite baseball player is in town for a game, and he desperately wants an autograph. Impeding this are Gaster and Gruber, who kidnap the star athlete in an effort to force him to sign autographs for eternity, making them rich. This may be my favorite episode of the series. The simple premise quickly turns ridiculous, as Gaster and Gruber kidnap the ball player in their blimp, locking him in a cage with his enormous banana. The animation here is also at its peak, specifically the crumbling warehouse, and it has the sweetest ending hands down a must-watch episode. Episode 23, Like a Surfer. The Parappa crew come upon a disheartened Prince Flea Swallow, longing for his beloved Catherine. Little do they know, Catherine isn't who they expect it to be. Another appearance of a character from the games. Prince Flea Swallow is more morose than his PlayStation counterpart, but just as cool. The friendship between Parappa and Flea Swallow is engaging. You can see their relationship is just a bit different than Parappa has with other people, and it parlays into a satisfying ending with the prettiest image of the entire show. And finally, episode 26. I'm sure I'll have muscular pain tomorrow. The school hockey team will be dissolved unless they win their last game of the season. When the team quits early, Katie recruits Parappa and Co. into joining the team in an attempt to win. A rare episode centered around Katie, 
Her true intent for saving the hockey team is a mystery, as to why, conceived by the gang. The group's effort to help out are inspiring, and seeing them in more action-oriented roles is a great change of pace. In late January 2002, the series would conclude its 30-episode run. Unfortunately, the show didn't move the needle for Parappa's popularity as originally wanted. During the time period it aired, or shortly after depending on your country, Parappa the Rapper 2 would release on the PlayStation 2, offering more of what fans and critics loved from the first Parappa game and its spin-off Um Jammer Lammy. Despite this, Parappa 2 failed to gain the same financial results as its predecessor, likely leading to Sony's lack of enthusiasm to continue with the franchise. Although not the fault of the television cartoon, it wasn't the successful promotional tool the Parappa team hoped it would be. Parappa co-creator Rodney Greenblatt believes the combination of an incorrectly targeted demographic and dissimilarity from the source material was what watered down the potential the show could have had. Quote, The animation company got the license from Sony to make a Parappa anime for kids. I was really disappointed. I really thought it should be like the original game. Not exactly for kids and not exactly about kids, but just this crazy world where these characters would do anything and it would be really fun and wild. The show really wasn't very fun. It's got its moments, but compared to the games, it's so tame. It's a schoolyard, kids are in class. It's so funny because none of that happens in the games. It could have been a hit if we kept the music and the whole thing going. I think we could have had a pretty great show, but it was okay for what it was. It had its problems. Since then, the Parappa franchise has largely remained dormant. 2006-2007 saw the original Parappa game released on the PSP in honor of the franchise's 10-year anniversary. And in 2017, a 4K remaster came out on the PlayStation 4. In 2012, Parappa made an appearance as a playable character in the fighting game PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. But despite these occasional pop-ups of the hip-hop hero, there still has not been a proper new entry into the series. The drought of Parappa games has been an enduring one. But for those looking to satisfy their craving for more content featuring the hip-hop dog, despite Greenblatt's contention, I find the anime to be a fantastic companion piece. The character still retained the likability displayed in the games, and it maintains the happiness and cheer blended with an off-kilter sense of humor, lacking even the slightest bit of malevolence. Though the Parappa the Rapper anime ultimately was a failed marketing tactic to try and sell an upcoming video game, what resulted was the production of a wholly enjoyable cartoon, filled with an abundance of joy. And while the anime never became the smash hit it was supposed to be, it was another enjoyable starring vehicle for gaming's greatest rapper that does honor to its source material, and in my mind, that makes it a success. <laughs>